The last time I gave a commencement address, I spoke about what education is not. I highlighted the classical notion of what it means to be educated, and I also attempted to undermine the false wisdom present in the majority of other commencement addresses, the typical commencement address. Today, I want to fall a little bit more in line with that great tradition of graduation speeches. And in that grand tradition, I would like to offer the class of 2023 one single piece of advice that I hope you'll take into the remainder of your lives. I believe that this advice is important. It's crucial for your success in college. It's important if you want to start a family. And it's even more pivotally crucial for those who enter the religious life or the priesthood. This advice that I want to offer the class of 2023 is to nurture, work at, and enjoy a rich life of the mind. Now what I'm not saying is that you should spend all your time studying, amassing a cornucopia of facts, pithy quotes, and statistics. What I'm not saying is that you should be an egghead or a nerd. What I am saying is this, that the life of the mind is important for your happiness, it is important for your success in all your endeavors, it's important for your sanity, and it is important for your sanctity. So what does it mean to have a rich life of the mind? Yes, it does mean reading books. There are great books that can enrich your mind's life. But it also means watching a sunset. It's also looking into the eyes of a child. It's the vigorous conversation with a friend, conversations about things that matter. It's singing songs and making music. It's quiet contemplation, and it's the starry night sky without light pollution. The life of the mind is made rich by poetry, study, conversation, and more generally, just taking the world in. Now the trick with cultivating a rich intellectual life is removing obstacles to it. I've identified four primary obstacles to the future of the life of your mind. So you have to remove them if you want to follow my advice. The first is an overemphasis on and overindulgence in the pleasures of the flesh. Remaining in your base senses will prevent the flourishing of your mind. You have to fast from these pleasures. The second is non-intentionality. You cannot accidentally have a rich interior life. You cannot accidentally have a life of the mind, an intellectual life. You have to plan for it and work at it. The third obstacle is practicality. Fascination with what is practical will prevent your intellectual life from blossoming. Ultimately, the life of the mind is useless. I've listed some benefits, and I'll go over those benefits some more. It will make you happy, successful, sane, and holy. But the life of the mind is prevented from flourishing by trying to put bread on the table, bring home the bacon, and complaining about politics. The life of the mind must be pursued for its own sake, and not for the sake of some practical benefit. The fourth and final obstacle to the life of the mind is anything with a screen or a speaker. The technology we carry around with us every day and try and hide from our teachers, these windows into hell that we keep in our pockets, they are perhaps the most difficult barrier to a rich intellectual life. So much for the obstacles to this life. I've told you that a rich intellectual life has certain benefits. The first benefit is that it will make you happy. It will bring fulfillment for what you were made and called by God to be. The mind was made to see. The mind was made to become one with other things, with all of reality. Aristotle began one of his most important books with the line, all human beings by nature desire to know. St. Thomas Aquinas said, since bodily pleasures are vehement and strong, 
They are sought by those who cannot enjoy other pleasures. They are sought by those who, since they know nothing of intellectual delights, incline only to physical pleasures. How quickly might we turn to the sins of the flesh if our hearts do not know the delights of the mind? The life of the mind is delightful, and if you want to be happy, you will cultivate a rich life of the mind. And this life will also make you successful. You might be going to a college that has all sorts of good and wonderful things to teach you. You might be seeking out career-specific formation. Perhaps you'll one day be a priest, a nun, a stay-at-home mom, a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, an architect, or a businessman. In any case, exercising your mind is imperative. Not just working it out like a muscle, not just knowing more things, but nurturing it so that it delights in the right things. You want it to work quickly and efficiently, and you want to love your job. The life of the mind will make you more successful. In getting a job, it's often said that your qualifications matter less than who you know. I got my job at St. Joseph Academy because I knew Mr. Murray and Ms. Smith. In business negotiations, those who continually cultivate the life of the mind are the ones that are the most interesting to speak with. They're the ones who know how to make good business relationships because they see clearly and think deeply. They are more interesting. If you want to be successful, become interesting and cultivate a rich life of the mind. So I'm promising also that the intellectual life will offer you some sanity, focusing on the practical matters of life and being too intent on what's going on in our screens and in our politics, instead of real life in front of you, and indulging in our lower passions, that sort of life will drive you crazy. It will depress you. The tyranny of the urgent and the tyranny of the flesh will certainly rob you of all joy, even in the things you used to love. A rich life of the mind, though, offers stability and sanity. Walt Whitman wrote this poem called When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. It's a short poem and goes like this. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them. When I sitting heard the astronomer when he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. In this poem, it's not until the narrator sees the stars in silence that he understands what the learned astronomer probably forgot. There is a danger in not having a genuine intellectual life. I don't mean that we all need to be an Aristotle or a Thomas Aquinas, but I do suggest that we are not complete as human beings if we do not have a real taste for learning and take a real delight in it. So if you want to stay sane in this crazy world, cultivate a rich life of the mind. The life of the mind is also essential if you want to be a saint. There's Catholic teaching that seems like it always rubs people the wrong way when they learn it. Folks are typically a little bit shocked to find it to be true and often never fully consider the consequences. We tend to have these romantic visions of heaven as clouds and halos and naked baby angels with harps. Yet consider what heaven truly is. It is nothing else but peering into the face of the triune God for all eternity. It is the perfect love and worship of him who is the creator and redeemer of our fallen humanity. Many people, when they learn that this is what heaven is, sometimes they take another peek at the alternative. Do I really want to go to heaven? 
Do I really want a perpetual intellectual vision of God's face for all eternity? It's a reasonable thing to ask. And if you haven't cultivated the life of the mind and taken delight in intellectual goods, then of course such a life for all eternity sounds boring. Sometimes I describe heaven to people as an eternal mass. And typically that gives them pause. I can't handle an hour-long mass, let alone an eternity of it. Saint Jose Maria Escrivan said, do you find the mass is too long? That's because your love is too short. The intellectual life builds that love. It builds our ability to see and hear God in life and in liturgy. The fact is that there is nothing more fulfilling for our human nature, nothing more restful for our restless hearts than the perfect and eternal vision of the face of love himself. And as we heard in the psalm at Mass today, the just will gaze on your face, O Lord. However, we have to make ourselves into the kinds of people that delight in what we ought to delight in. We have to train our minds to delight in what is good and true and beautiful. Consider what St. Paul says in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, finally, graduates, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Think about things that are true, good, and beautiful. This sort of thinking conditions our souls to take delight in those things. And this is what it means to have a rich intellectual life. Getting into heaven is much more than avoiding sin. We have to condition our souls to desire heavenly beatitude. And that's an important part of sanctity. Multiple saints have divined prayer as the raising of the mind to God. Of course, our Lord himself said that the greatest commandment involves including loving God with your whole mind. If you want to be a saint, and if you want a rich life of prayer, cultivate the life of the mind. And as you move on to college and career, to vocation and to adulthood, remember to be intentional about seeing the world, about seeing your neighbor, about seeing the face of God with a rich interior life, a rich life of the mind. Congratulations to the class of 2023. Thank you.